It may not be immediately obvious, but there was a point in time that the Netherlands was on the forefront of the economic world, considered by many to be the world's first advanced economy. One of the most significant entities to come out of this Dutch economic revolution was the United East India Company, often stylized as the VOC because of its original Dutch name. Over their roughly 200 year lifetime, the United East India Company became not only a competitive force in Europe, but the world's most successful corporation in history. The United East India Company was founded in 1602, as a response to the founding of the English East India Company only two years prior. The idea was to conglomerate Dutch merchant power and ensure that individual Dutch traders were protected financially, because of how risky the trip to the East Indies was. The United East India Company was granted a monopoly over the East Indies by the Dutch government, and they established their first permanent trading post in Banten in 1603. Eventually, they began forming ports and trading posts all over the Indian and Pacific Ocean, competing with many European powers, including the English East India Company. In 1619, Jan Peter Schoen Kuhn was appointed Governor General of the United East India Company, and he had big plans for their future. One of his first major acts was to have the city that would become modern Jakarta in Indonesia stormed by the Dutch and turned into a local headquarters for them, renamed as Batavia. He also had natives on the Bond Islands ruthlessly starved out, killed, or forced into work on plantations that produced spices for trade. He also saw a potential in them to dominate the Asian markets through manipulating trade goods between various kingdoms and empires in Asia. The problem the Dutch, and most other European nations, faced was a lack of precious metals to trade with. The solution was this idea of an intra-Asiatic trade, where goods would be traded between Asian kingdoms and wealth would be established that way before having goods or metals sent back to the Netherlands. A key part of this plan was that supplies and materials would come in from the Netherlands to Batavia, where it would be distributed to all other Dutch holdings in the area that needed it. Additionally, silver and copper would be traded out of Japan, where the Dutch held the only port open to Europeans for about 200 years at Dejima, and that would be used to help fund the other trades made. Along with the spice trade, the Dutch began to hold a monopoly on. The Dutch would then trade with various empires and kingdoms, such as the Mughal Empire in India or the Ming Dynasty in China, for all sorts of textiles such as cotton or silk, as well as other goods like porcelain. All of this trading between Asian peoples let them accumulate a vast wealth in a very short amount of time. By the late 1660s, the United East India Company was the richest private company in the world, held about 150 merchant ships, 50 warships, 50,000 employees, and a private army roughly 10,000 strong. The Dutch were also able to levy their strength against the English in several conflicts known as the Anglo-Dutch Wars. They lost the first Anglo-Dutch War, but came back and won both the second and third Anglo-Dutch Wars. There was a fourth war, but we'll talk about that a bit later. Even though the Dutch had won the second and third Anglo-Dutch Wars, by the end of the third one, the English had begun to aggressively push their way into a market previously monopolized by the Dutch. The third Anglo-Dutch War specifically caused a massive spike in spice prices in Europe leading to the English East India Company forcing their way into that market. Also, by the 1600s, even though the price of spices was still spiking, the overall value of spices to East India companies was decreasing, and other goods such as textiles became more prominent in the European market. This proved problematic for the Dutch, who were relying almost solely on their profits from the spice trade, and how it linked in with their intra-Asiatic trade plan. The United East India Company attempted to move trade posts and skill up their influence, however it often yielded less and less profits than before. One key example was when the ruler of Calicut was forced to submit to Dutch rule in 1710, but later reneged on this deal and renounced the Dutch with the help of the English. The Dutch initially tried to suppress this, but when they saw how the French and English were able to trade with the region regardless, the Dutch pulled out in 1721 losing significant influence on the local spice and pepper trade. 
By the 1730s, the United East India Company was still generally profiting, yes, but was losing much of its influence and was about to receive several blows to their profitability. Moving into the mid-18th century, there were many problems that the United East India Company were all finding it harder and harder to ignore. They were losing out significantly on the tea trade, a trade that made the Ostend Company and the English East India Company very rich. Additionally, where having a centralized headquarters in Batavia used to be a strength with central planning, it was now becoming a hindrance, making shipping take longer than it did for other trading companies. Finally, a major blow to the Dutch that had been steadily growing was their loss of influence in many key regions. They were finding it difficult, if not outright impossible, to keep a hold of their trading posts in key locations such as Persia, Surat, the Malabar Coast, and Bengal. One major blow to their power was in 1741, during the Battle of Kolachel when Raja Varma defeated the Dutch in an open battle, widely considered to be the first time an organized Asian force defeated a European force in open combat. After all of these issues became more and more prominent, the intra-Asiatic trade their finances depended on began to fall apart. The United East India Company persisted until 1780, with many looking to reform and try to revamp the system, until it was dealt its final death blow during the Fourth Anglo-Dutch War. By this point, the Dutch were no match for the British fleets, and the United East India Company lost roughly half of its fleet, much of its cargo, and even more control over Asia. The company was kept alive, but only barely for many years. Finally, on December 31st, 1799, the charter was allowed to expire, and what used to be the world's most valuable company had ceased to exist. One of the most commonly cited statistics among the United East India Company is how, in 1637, they were roughly $7.9 trillion, translated to modern valuations. As of 2017, that's roughly equal to the 20 largest corporations or combining the GDPs of both Germany and Japan. While translating the value of a company from hundreds of years ago can be a shaky science, the general point is that, at its height, the United East India Company was by far the most powerful company in the world, and one of the most powerful entities in general. So, how did this happen? How were they able to dominate the markets so successfully for so long? Well, it's incredibly complex, but it can be roughly boiled down to three main reasons. First, the Dutch economy. Many scholars consider the Netherlands to be one of, if not the, first advanced economy in the world. The Dutch lands had vast amounts of wind and water power to push their proto-industrialized society forward. While at the height of their naval supremacy, the Dutch GDP per capita was twice that of its European neighbors, and they were on the forefront of economics, with an efficient tax and public debt system that allowed them to borrow from their citizens to advance the country, something that was relatively unheard of at the time. The second reason they were so successful was their ability to monopolize on specific trades. Although this specialization ended up being their downfall in the end, for a while, it meant that they dictated the prices that Europeans would pay for many goods, specifically spices. They also used this idea of free seas to edge the Portuguese out of Asia and moved in to replace Portugal as the maritime powerhouse of the region. The third and final reason they were so successful was because of the Dutch's ability to build better boats and sell them better too. Building better boats was in part from the fact that they were industrialized relative to their size, but also because they had become accustomed to building boats and had the technique down, because they really had no other choice in their geographic location to be anything but great boat builders. For similar reasons, they were also very good at navigating the waters. Additionally, even though they were noticeably smaller than all of their neighbors, the Dutch merchant fleet in the 1670s was likely larger than the combined fleets of England, France, Spain, Portugal, and all of the German princelings and kingdoms of the Holy Roman Empire. 
All in all, despite its many shortcomings by the end of its lifetime, the questionable legacy it may have had with expanding European imperialism and slavery, the United East India Company is, undoubtedly, not only one of the most successful companies in world history, but also one of the most influential. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like and subscribe to see more. Ring the bell next to it so you get updated whenever I make an upload, and you can stay updated on whatever I'm doing by following my Twitter. Links to everything are in the description. Thank you very much for watching, this has been Historical Hindsight, and I'll be seeing you soon.